So, welcome to my introduction to the American literature element of the OCR A level. This was made in 2017 to support my students studying the OCR A level, the first cohort, incidentally, to be going all, through, all the way through without the option of the AS exam. In this screencast, I'm hoping to give a brief introduction to the course itself using the materials that OCR provide us with, but also to give you an opening discussion, if you like, about the writers and the texts that we are studying. So, so we move on into a look at the content of the course as put together by OCR. You'll see that we're in component two, that is to say paper two of the exam, and you'll see that we have within this, um, we have an exam which requires us to read two core texts, and we'll be reading Gatsby and Huck Finn um, as these two. They're taught in detail, and because it's a comparative question with the main focus on context and linking of the texts, we read these perhaps in a rather broader way than we might otherwise do. Not only that, there is a definite requirement for you reading these texts to engage with as much wider reading as you can. The more you've read, the better you'll be able to appreciate the narrative elements of these texts, but also to answer the unseen question, which is component uh, two, the second half of that paper. You will be given a passage of unseen American literature, and your task will be to do a literary analysis of, the, of this passage, but also to make links from the passage to other works of American literature, which you can see similarities. Um, developing with within the unseen passage. Now you can use Gatsby and you can use Huck, we'll have taught them both, but you need more reference than that. In other words, you need a fairly comprehensive reading background of American literature 1880 to 1940. And we'll look briefly now at how the course fits together in terms of what I mean by that. Here we see from the board itself the background to what we are studying. We see that we're reading American literature here um, on the left hand side, but also we begin to look at what we're required to do here in the knowledge, skills and understanding column. Required to explore contrast, connections and comparisons between literary texts within the context of the area. Finding everything we can about these, we look for the key themes, we look to see how those appear elsewhere in the writing. We look for setting, perhaps, <clears throat> and we see how that appears elsewhere in the writing. We're exploring the ways in which texts relate to one another and literary traditions, movements and genres. Again, we'll need a working knowledge of what is happening in America at this time between the Gilded Age of um, the 1880s, when Twain is writing, and the Jazz Age, when Fitzgerald is writing his masterpiece. We'll be looking at different readings what do people say? Do every do people agree? Is there a, a single thought about any of these texts? And the answer is obvious. The answer is no. But we need to study that and we need to know a few of these ideas um, in terms of that. We want to look at the way literary concepts, critical concepts, are can be applied to these texts. And we'll get on and do that as well, looking obviously at the, the obvious sort of feminism and Marxism and so on. The a modern uh, critical positions, things like eco-criticism, what is happening, reading things through the danger or otherwise the environment is actually quite profitable, I think, with both of these texts. We'll look at the full context of the writing. Now, you should be able to remember from your IGCSE days that there are basically two forms of context, the socio-historical and the literary. So it's important that we recognise our various forms of context. We understand that a text like Finn, for example, written in the 1880s, so there's a social context there, in or by a man who was certainly by this stage in his life wealthy and living in the northeast. Again, another social context that is important, given that Twain does not originate from that part of America. But he's writing about 30 years or 50 years rather earlier, the 1830s, 1840s. So again, a new social context. 
how was that received in the 1880s? How do we look at it now? And particularly in a text like Finn, in light of attitudes towards race and obviously slavery and so on here. You're meant to be finding personal and creative responses to the chosen text. This is important. What you think matters, you will not find, as perhaps you found at GCSE, either of your teachers terribly quick to simply tell you what to think. I don't think we ever really did that anyway. But this is about you. It's about your study of literature. And we need to look at the way you are reading literature and you need to start to develop your critical faculties. There are other texts um, in relation to the two core texts we have. These are the ones that we could have read as the second text. We've chosen Huckleberry Finn, but you can see the others. And one of your first tasks will be gradually over the first year in year 12 to read each of these texts. I'll be buying a few into the school and you can share them and to use your reading to put together a short book report um, on each of these so that we begin to get an understanding and begin to find relationships between these novels of, of different writers, different times, different you know, sorts of writing. The, the wonderfully almost repressed writing of someone like Edith Wharton, which bursts into the, the new age of Fitzgerald, is really quite an interesting uh, comparison. Somebody like Wharton is writing at a time when nobody talked about sex or anything of that nature. Suddenly after the war, everybody did. And there's a shattering, if you like, of the old ways. This is the sort of thing we need to be looking at and the sort of thing which I hope you. So our two authors, Twain and Fitzgerald, they're both um, authors born in the 19th century, I think, but you'll find here Twain is writing in the late 19th. Scott, post-war writer, really, first, first post-First World War. They both write at a time of relative prosperity, following a time of, well, in both cases, war-torn hardship, the Civil War for Twain, the First World War for Fitzgerald. Both are concerned with the nature of the society in which they live. Twain will call this civilization in his vernacular spelling that Huck uses throughout. And we realise that for Twain, civilization is not a good thing. Both use first person narrators to tell their tales. We need to look at this again and the effect of this. Many of my students will have read To Kill a Mockingbird as a GCSE text. Again, another young first person narrator. And we will have spent time talking about Scout and how reliable her narrative is and how we see elements of her youth coming through. And how does Scout and the author mix? I'm not saying that Huck is as autobiographical as Mockingbird. But there's no doubt that Huck is the boy that Twain or both was to a degree, but also wished he could return to. Again, the first proper task on the texts will be to research the two writers in detail and fill out the details in their lives and socio-historical contexts behind the writings. And what I would say now is you're going to get quite some information over the next couple of slides. Use these slides as a springboard. I'm not going to fill in the information too strongly, but don't just come back and regurgitate what I've said to you. Taking Twain first, and I've put him here in speech marks because it's a pen name. Um, you can find out what it means. He was born Samuel Clemens in Missouri in 1835 on the banks of the M Mississippi. And we need to think about why he took this pen name and what we might get out of it. In his early life, he traveled as a journalist and a humorist in the Midwest and down into the more southern states. And in the 1850s, he was working as a steamboat pilot on the Mississippi. Now, this is important, and we will look at the, the role the river plays in his life and in the novel and everything else as we complete our studies, but it's an area that you should be looking at. The Civil War of 1861 to 1865 ended the Mississippi boat traffic almost forever, um, and certainly this free and easy way of life that is celebrated in Huck. For Twain, who had served briefly in the Confederate Army during the war. This was something that he found hard to come to terms with. After the war, in his more adult and more uh, years, and when he needed to write, having married, although his wife was from a very wealthy family, he needed to sustain, needed to have his 
his writing. He struggled to be taken seriously with, in as it were, the, what I'm calling the Eastern USA, the old states, if you like, the the areas around cities like Boston um, and even New York, which saw it saw themselves as very much the winners of the war, the arbiters of everything that was good, if you like, in terms of taste, and. Twain's background in the South and West was an obstacle. He was seen as a humorist, not as a senior, uh, uh, sorry, not as a serious writer. And the new wealth of the country, which gave rise, one of these things I'm going to ask you to look into, to the Gilded Age, was an age that would destroy Twain's somewhat idealised view of the antebellum Mississippi life. He was despite this, hugely successful. He was also very successful as a speaker and a writer in America and Europe. He lived for quite a time in Europe uh, towards the end of his life, though eventually died in 1910 in Connecticut. Plenty of material here for you to start to look into in terms of further investigation of Mark Twain. F. Scott Fitzgerald. Again, rather as with Twain, I'm going to tell you what the F stands for. You can look it up for yourselves. You need to start to engage. And as I always maintain, what you seek for yourselves, you will remember. So his life, 1896 to 1940, a much shorter life. <clears throat> he died of a heart attack. He was well known as an alcoholic from a relatively early age. Um, he didn't die necessarily through alcohol. He wasn't drunk at the time of his death, but... He was a man who perhaps embraced some of the ideas, some of the flaws, shall we say, of some of the characters about whom he writes. He, too, was born out of the immediately um, high, shall we say, Eastern uh, culture. He was born in Minnesota. However, he was very well educated at being sent to very good Catholic schools and Princeton University. Um, he also enlisted in the army in 1917. There's a little parallel here that some of you might want to explore between Jay Gatsby and Scott Fitzgerald. When he came out of the army, his writing really set him up as a flag bearer of the new jazz age in post-war USA. Now, we give this name of this period after the First World War, the jazz age, partly because of the musical um, upspringing of jazz as a concept, but also because jazz somehow underpins life at this time. Jazz has few rules. Jazz is seen as somewhat loose and not necessarily highly respectable, very fitting for the world about which Fitzgerald is writing, but also the world which was horrifying. The older generation in the 20s, girls in short skirts dancing the Charleston, women with jobs, professions, women having the vote, all these features of new post-war USA was something that appear in his works and the moral license perhaps evident in his work was, was appalling for many. He, like Twain, was a harsh critic of a society that he generally saw as immoral and he works in Gatsby to expose the moral vacuum at the heart of society. This, this idea that an age which has both prohibition and unlicensed quantities of alcohol if one can break the law and pay for it. A world still of high formality, but also sexual liberation. This collision is what makes Fitzgerald's contexts so interesting. And it's something that I hope I will enjoy finding out um, more about as you research. So the two texts, <clears throat> well, um, I apologise, incidentally, for the way the footer has ridden up on this screen. I'm not quite sure why this particular piece of software I use has done this. Anyway, Huck, narrated by a 14-year-old boy. Um, Huck has appeared before. He appeared in Twain's shorter novel, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, and I would recommend any of you, if not reading it whole, at least to have a good look at it. It is set on the Mississippi in the 1840s, and you know, setting is often the key to almost everything, and many people would argue that the river is a character in its own right in this text. It's the main highway north-south at this time. Twain knew it well. It carries our two runaways in a seemingly arbitrary fashion. It's very relevant that they choose to travel by raft rather than by boat. They have no control whatsoever 
over where the river takes them to all intents and purposes. You can steer it, but ultimately you're at the mercy of the current. It's particularly ironic that the escaping or the runaway slave, Jim, of course, is running away towards the south. He can't float north. So the longer the book continues, the more in danger he is. I'll let you work out how that works in the novel um, as we go on. So they're driven by what a writer, I suppose similarly contemporary writer of, of Twain's in many ways, um, Thomas Hardy, would have called Hap. They come across people and they interact with these people taken there by the river. And Huck's character develops as the book progresses as a result of the people he meets and the perhaps moral questions he's forced to ask, him, ask himself. Um, these are questions about, for example, slavery, um, looking at Jim, looking at the way uh, this is, he is presented. Huck's opinions and Twain's opinions, of course, are similar in many, many ways, but we need to see how that works and how that fits together. Um, we look at this idea that to the people from the South who were arguing to keep slavery in the run-up and during the Civil War, Negro slaves were seen as childlike. They were seen as, excuse me, they were seen as, well, lacking a full maturity, if you like. And there is an innocence and naivety about Jim, which matches that of the 14-year-old Huck. And we don't need to work out whether we find this is convincing or whether we think it's laid on a little bit too much. Another key idea in the text is that of freedom. And of course, if you have freedom, restriction. This idea of cultural, mental and physical freedoms and restrictions run throughout the texts. Honesty and fraud are explored. The honesty of Huck and Jim is generally set against almost everybody else they meet, from Huck's father through the king and the duke. Uh, the appalling behaviour um, of the Grangerfords in terms of the feud scene and so on. In Gatsby, we're looking at the 1920s, a time when there was an emergence of a very wealthy class with looser morals than before, is what I'm saying here. Prohibition had been brought in partly as a moral crusade, and the law was regularly broken to obtain alcohol. What Fitzgerald is able to show us here is the way this high society flaunts its wealth in quite appalling degree and its law-breaking, and its ability to get hold of alcohol and everything else. And it's dissected by Fitzgerald, um, who creates a narrator who will watch, but is ultimately totally unable to influence the actions of the protagonist and has to watch the world that he seems to admire and, and almost at times seems to be jealous of as it self-destructs in front of him. We look at questions of class, the idea of the wealthy elite placed against poverty of those who are struggling to make a living. Um, New York at the same time is expanding ever closer to these, well, idyllic worlds um, that our protagonists inhabit as an East and West Egg. Um, the wastelands that we drive through to get to New York will, of course, become the city. And there is an interesting um, discussion here about the way in which the environment is being destroyed by the avarice and the wealth of those seeking to follow the dream. And we look at the dream here, um, not just the straightforward American dream of self-sufficiency, although that is there, but also the idealized dream that Gatsby carries on a more personal level of Daisy. Um, she, with a voice that, you know, that, that is full of money, as um, Fitzgerald says, has a different outlook. She is interested in wealth, wealth for its own sake. Gatsby is putting on his show ostensibly to recreate his dream in the hope that Daisy will come across to him. What we see instead is the destruction of a world that has gone before. Women are presented interestingly in this text. Um, there is a real sense that women in this text are vacuous, unable to take responsibility for their actions. They may well be cheats, um, competing on a level playing field with men by cheating, um, as we will see in Jordan Baker. 
And if they're neither of these two things, and perhaps they don't have the wealth or the class, the background to be the, one of these two things, then they are usually victims, in the case of Myrtle, of male aggression. We will spend some time with the description of essentially rape by automobile. This is a book about illusion and reality. Gatsby's life is a, is a fabrication. Rumours abound. So much is built up through his own uh, descriptions of himself, but also what others say of him. And it's late in the novel that we discover what he actually is, and we discover the much more tawdry reality of Gatsby's life and Gatsby's wealth. I won't spoil that. That's something that we have to read. And again, we'll think about that much more as the term goes on. During term one, uh, you're going to need to engage in some research, and I will be uh, looking for these projects, effectively, to be presented around half term. You can divide up what we've got here between yourselves, and if you can think of another, any other areas to consider, I'm more than happy to let you go into that. So we'll be looking at the pioneer life for Finn, but also the life of post-war USA in terms of Gatsby. One of you will be, or a pair of you will be looking at the Civil War, the impact of the Civil War, what it meant, the background. Don't just focus on the slavery. In many ways, the industry and the implications on the Southern way of life of the Northern victory is actually more interesting. And we might set that against in Gatsby, looking at the way women in society changed their role, position in society in the early 20th century leading up to the 1930s. I want somebody to do a bit of research about life on and around the Mississippi, 1840 to 1870, shall we say, looking at what I've already referred to, this main artery of business and commerce between North and, North and South, which was simply severed by the Civil War, and what the effect of that was on the people who lived in that area. That might be set, if you like, against the American dream, this idea of the self-sufficient, successful man, woman, able to cut out something for themselves. Finally, I want a couple of presentations on the Gilded Age and the Jazz Age to round off our ideas there. So, without further ado, I think we come to the end of a presentation, which I hope will enable you to have enough material to start preparing your work for this course. The main work on the text will take place in the winter and spring term of the lower sixth. We'll come back to them in the upper sixth to run some comparison. But that's where most of the work will be done on these two texts. And between your two teachers, you will find plenty of assistance, but also plenty of encouragement to go and develop your ability to work for yourselves, because that is what we need to see. So without further ado, I will uh, sign off and let you get down to some work. <laughs>